The president. Question. Questions. Question number one, Mr. Lau Kuo Fan. Thank you, Mr. President. There are views pointing out that upon the commencement of service of the new signaling system of MTR East Rail Line or ERL in February last year, ERL's maximum carrying capacity per hour per direction is 82,500 passenger trips, which is less than 101,000 passenger trips under the old system. With the increase patronage of ERL upon commissioning of Cross Harbor Extension, coupled with an expected population growth of over 200,000 along the railway lines in New Territory East in the coming few years, the loading of ERL will become even heavier. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, given that the current average headway of ERL during peak hours is about 2.7 minutes, which is still quite a distance from the maximum headway of about two minutes under the new ERL signaling system, whether it knows if the MTR CL has put in place a timetable for increasing the train frequencies to the highest level during peak hours. Two, whether it will, by drawing reference from the experience of overseas countries, study arranging those local trains commonly known as short trippers, that is trains that will not run the entire railway line across the harbour, to serve on ERL or provide harbour crossing trains with additional train cars, the doors of which will remain closed, and instruct passengers to board and alight such trains via those train cars, the doors of which will be open during peak hours, and three, whether it will construct a new north-south railway line and study the preliminary alignment as well as formulate a timetable for expediting the implementation of the works so as to divert the passengers of ERL. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the East Rail Line, or EAL, Cross Harbour Extension was commissioned in 15th of May this year and has become the fourth Cross Harbour Railway Line in Hong Kong. Passengers can travel directly between the Northeast New Territories and Hong Kong Island and interchange with five other railway lines via four interchange stations on the EAL. The commissioning of an extension is an important milestone of railway development, providing faster and more convenient railway services. My reply to the question raised by Mr. Lau Fan is as follows. One and two. The entire EAL is now using nine car trains and a new signaling system. Apart from shortening the journey time between Shangshui and Hong Kong stations by about eight minutes, there will be room to increase train frequency based on passenger demand. The train frequency of the EAL during the morning peak has increased from about three minutes before commissioning of the cross harbor extension to about 2.7 minutes now. According to the MTRCL's observation, the critical link of the EAL during the busiest one hour in the morning peak is the Tai Wai to Kalantong section, with a loading of about 73% based on four standing persons per square meter. The commissioning of the EAL Cross Harbor Extension has also brought diversion effect on other railway lines. According to preliminary observations, there has been a drop in patronage of the critical link in the morning peak of the Chunwan line by more than 20% and a drop of about 10% for that of the Kuntong line, resulting in more even distribution of patronage in the whole railway network. The MTRCO is aware that there are clusters of passengers during particular period of time and at particular stations and train compartments during the morning peak. It has therefore adopted a series of measures to facilitate passenger flow, including implementing passenger diversion measures at stations in the north, northern new territory, such as Fanling and Taiwan stations, to guide passengers to board the trains at the less crowded areas of platform using technology including the Cross Harbour EC display panels and train car loading indicator to divert passengers to less crowded railway lines and train compartments so as to achieve a more even distribution of patronage. And arranging short-haul trips for stations with more passengers to improve passenger flow, such as arranging short-haul trips from Sha Tin and Taipo Market stations to Admiralty Station during the morning peak. The government has always encouraged the MTRCL to explore measures to improve passenger flow and enhance passengers' traveling experience. MTRCL will consider various proposals holistically, including whether or not 
the measure suit the traveling patterns of most passengers, the passenger waiting time, and train schedules. For example, one of the advantages of the EAL is to enable passengers to travel directly between the Northeast New Territories and Hong Kong Island without interchanging. If some trains do not cross the harbour during peak hours, passengers going to Hong Kong Island will have to interchange at Hong Ham or other stations, thus increasing their travelling time and correspondingly the waiting time of passengers travelling from Hong Kong Island to Northeast New Territories. Regarding the suggestion to provide cross, uh, harbour crossing trains with train cars, the doors of which do not open, this will increase the time for passengers moving in and out of the train cars and in turn affect train creep frequency. Passengers may also need to move along train compartments while the trains are in motion, resulting in safety risks. The government will continue to urge MTRCL to adjust train services and arrange short haul trips running between busy stations as needed based on patronage and the actual situation to meet passenger demand. The government has been advocating the infrastructure-led and capacity-creating planning approaches in taking forward transport infrastructure projects with a view to unleashing the development potentials of new development areas along the alignment of major transport infrastructure. Transport and Housing Bureau will make its best endeavours to, co to collaborate with the Development Bureau and other bureaus to ensure the provisioning of sufficient transport infrastructure to accommodate the transport need arising from population intake, employment, economic activities of the new development areas. Areas. As regards the long-term planning of railway network, based on the development strategy of the Hong Kong 2030 Plus towards a planning vision and strategy transcending 2030 planning study, we are conducting the strategic studies on railways and major roads beyond 2030 to explore the overall layout of territory-wide railway and major road infrastructure and conduct preliminary engineering and technical assessments for the alignments and supporting facilities so as to ensure that the related plan will complement and even reserve capacity to meet the overall long-term development needs of Hong Kong, including northern metropolis development strategy, etc. The study will also review the impacts of the related transport infrastructure on the existing transport network and to formulate the corresponding strategies. We plan to consolidate the preliminary study findings and commence public consultation in the second half of this year. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Lau Kofan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the Secretary mentioned infrastructure-led, but now we do not have quarantine-free travel with the mainland. And every day at the platform, platforms, uh, there are already crowds. I asked the Secretary when the train frequency of EAL will be increased to the maximum. That is uh, two minutes headway. But the Secretary did not answer me. I understand that uh, for EAL there are 34 trains in total. If we are to increase the train frequency to two minutes, how many trains are we talking about? And is there a timetable for the train frequency to be increased? You haven't answered me. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Mr. Lau for the follow-up question. At the moment, the headway at the moment is 2.7 minutes. Now we have a fleet of 34 trains in operation at the moment, and the MTRCL has already procured three more trains, so as to increase the total number in the fleet from 34 to 37. The new trains should arrive in Hong Kong uh, progressively by the end of this year. Well, under the 37 train operation mode, the train frequency will be increased to 2.5 minutes headway. In terms of the new trains and new signaling system, the overall efficiency can be further increased to about a train every two minutes. And in order to achieve that, we need to have 42 trains. The MTRCL will therefore base its decision on the patronage of EAL at the busiest section during peak hour, with a loading of about 73%. And the MTRCL is of the view that the 37 car arra uh, train arrangement will 
cope with the current demand. But we will also take note of the traveling patterns and the changes and the increased trains if necessary. Ms. Chen Yutming. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the paper for Northern Development, uh, Northern uh, Metropolis Development Strategy, the goal is to increase the district population to 2.5 million. So, in the long run, there will be increase in population in Takuling um, North District, and the government plans to build a um, spur line together with more infrastructure in the area. More visitors will be encouraged to use EAL as well. So in terms of the long-term planning for East Rail Line, how will well, the government should take the infrastructure-led approach to make sure that uh, the trains will be ready to pick up passengers instead of the other way around? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the member for the reminder. In terms of infrastructure-led and capacity-creating planning approaches, as you know, in well, in a short period of time, we're able to increase the number of trains from 34 to 37, and in the long run to 42. We will also deploy short-haul trains to make sure that the waiting time for pa of passengers for trains will be shortened um, to improve the traveling experience. In terms of northern new territories and the northern metropolis development strategy, as you know, the plan maps out the number of railway projects including the one in Hongshou Q, there will be a mass trans transport system. In Northeast New Territories, there is also another proposal to build an extension line for the Northern Link. In terms of actual implementation, the government will consider uh, the overall planning and conduct further analysis. For phase one of Northern Link, works has I mean, the planning uh, has commenced, so has phase two. As for other plans in relation to uh, collaboration with Tianhai, we'll also continue to speed things up, and then we will follow the schedule and follow up on the uh, relevant issues. Mr. Gary Zhang. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the paper submitted by the government to LegCo, after installing screen doors at the platform, it would affect train frequency. And after commissioning of the Cross Harbor extension of East Rail Line, screen doors will also be installed. So this will, in theory, reduce train frequency. So has the government assessed the issue of installation of screen doors? And by how much will the average headway of 2.5 minutes be reduced? And how will the government ensure that the capacity and efficiency will remain the same so as not to affect the uh, service quality? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Zhang, for the questions. As I mentioned about increasing the train frequency of East Rail Line in terms of implementing arrangements and using technology, so we seek to improve passengers' traveling experience. As for installing screen doors, um, the preparations are underway. Of course, uh, everyone understands that uh, passengers should be put first. So um, uh, the majority of works are, is carried out during non-operating hours, such as uh, in, the, in the small hours after training services have been suspended. As for work procedures requiring longer periods of time, uh, they would be carried out usually during weekends and non-busy hours. And we will coordinate with the MTRCL to make sure that the store screen doors will be installed without affecting uh, Commuters, Mr. Yao Wing Kit, my question is this. In order to alleviate the burden on East Rail Line, will the first class uh, cars be scrapped so as to increase capacity further? Secretary, thank you. Since commissioning of the cross harbor extension of East Rail Line, uh, we understand that there has been a keen demand for first class uh, seats. Usually, passengers in the relevant cabins 
would commute during non-busy hours. So for some passengers, especially elderly passengers, they would like to um, travel more comfortably. Well, even taking first class seats at the fares are still affordable for the East Rail Line in particular. So when we talk about the loading of about 70% in the busiest one hour in the morning peak of East Rail Line, we believe we should keep the first class cars, uh, which is in line with uh, the public's expectation. But we'll keep in view the situation and adjust our uh, strategy accordingly. Uh, unless uh, there is demand arising in other aspects, we are going to keep the first class cabins. Mr. Stanley Lee, well, as mentioned by the Secretary, the East Rail Line is very convenient and it is attracting a lot of uh, commuters. But we have a nine car train arrangement and the trains are jam packed. I want to know from the government whether there are other plans to cope with the capacity issue. In fact, People have suggested that uh, we should use 10 or 11 car trains. When the trains arrive at the station, well, the commuters can alight um, at the ninth car instead of the 10th and 11th cars, with the doors of which will be closed. Will you consider other ways to alleviate uh, uh, crowdedness? Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lee, for the questions. In fact, I've given my reply uh, here, but let me also elucidate on the point. Well, when we constructed the Cross Harbour extension, we found constraints in the in terms of the uh, platforms on the island side, and we therefore restrict the arrangement to a nine-car train arrangement. And we understand that with a headway of about 2.7 minutes, if commuters remain in the 10th to the 12th car, and should they want to uh, get off the train, they may need to move to the first nine cars, and that will affect the uh, waiting time. And not to mention there is a safety risk, especially when uh, the trains are crowded during busy hours. And after all, there is a safety risk because uh, trains are traveling at speed. So in terms of the loading capacity, the, for the busiest one hour in the most um, crowded section of the line, there is a loading of about 73% only. So we don't find it necessary. And because of safety reasons, we have reservations about this suggestion. Mr. Andrew Lam, uh, please, please speak into the mic. After commissioning of the Cross Harbour extension of East Rail Line, many commuters originally uh, taking buses have switched to railway uh, commuting. In the event of uh, signalling faults or other incidents, which have, we have seen before, this will create major chaos during busy hours. And the MTRCL already explained that there is a response and coordination mechanism. My question for the government is, uh, what monitoring mechanism is put in place to make sure that uh, chaos arising from such incidents will be uh, put to a minimum? Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Lam, for his reminder. The mass transport is green, it is speedy and convenient, and it is sort of um, weatherproof, and it is the top choice for most commuters. As far as our consideration is concerned, the MTRCL's daily operation and planning should be up to standard first and foremost. Second, in terms of um, maintenance and repair of hardware, it should be done properly. And third, our response plan, that is, in the event of incidents, how do we provide um, alternative uh, transport for passengers? Let's say if the train services are delayed or even suspended, an emergency mechanism will be uh, will commence so that other transports such as buses, etc., would provide additional support so as to minimize uh, nuisances to commuters. At the same time, we also have a system with other transport operators for railway lines, 
and for buses and other modes of transport in the event of uh, suspension or congestion. Overall speaking, the transport department has an emergency coordination center to make sure different transports can be deployed to cope with the situation. You may have noticed that sometimes we even deploy ferries to address the issue of traffic congestion on the road. Mr. Gary Chen, well, we're all excited um, by the commissioning of the cross harbor section of the East Rail Line, but it has come too late. In a decade, our country has developed uh, space engineering. They have uh, space stations, uh, they have astronauts uh, reaching uh, the moon very soon. So my question for the secretary is this. Are installing screen doors uh, more difficult than allowing um, astronauts to travel to the moon? When are we going to see screen doors? Are screen, uh, um, will screen, screen doors be installed? only at the, when we are able to uh, travel to the moon. What have you done in this regard? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Chen. In terms of design and commissioning of East Rail Line, we need to go back to history. For KCRC section, um, at first, there weren't screen doors, and that's something that's already been included in our plan. And after full commissioning of the East Rail Line, we've already started preparation, including uh, drilling of holes on the platforms, laying um, ducts, laying of ducts, and calibration of um, arriving trains. And we understand for Taipo Market Station and the Racecourse Station. These two stations will be, will be the f among the first to see screen doors being installed. If I, if my memory serves me right, uh, the screen doors will be ready for these two stations by the end of 2023. And based on this experience, we will uh, follow up on the matter. For some stations, the curbs of the platforms are not in a straight line. So further study is necessary, but our goal is to make sure screen doors are installed as quickly as possible to ensure an enjoyable travel experience for passengers. Thank you, Mr. President. Starting from October, the government will implement the EV charge at home to subsidize the installation of EV charging infrastructure. The car parks, uh, if they fulfill the subsidy eligibility criteria, then they will subsidize $15 million for private buildings. And uh, could you inform the council under the scheme, the approved applications, how many of car parks can receive the full 30000 and uh, what are the number, total number of uh, spaces that will be eligible? And if car parks are more than can accommodate more than 500 cars, how many of them will uh, receive the full 15 million subsidy? And how many car park spaces are affected? And what is the average subsidy? And second, uh, the what are the criteria for vetting these applications? And how will the government determine whether the private estate and uh, for large uh, estates, if they are occupation permits are uh, issued in phases, how will they uh, allocate the spaces? Uh, Chairman, uh, President, first of all, I have to thank the Honorable Gary Chang for his attention and question on EV charging at home subsidy scheme. The government launched the two billion EHSS uh, uh, in October 2020 with the aim of providing technical and financial support to car parks of existing private residential buildings, which generally have multiple ownership to promote the installation of electrical vehicle charging enabling infrastructure so that individual owners or users of parking spaces can install EV charges of their choice according to their specific needs and charge EVs at their own estates in the future. Since the launch of EHSS to end of May 2022, a total of 589 applications have been received, which covers over 120,000 parking spaces. 
more than double the original target of about 60,000 parking spaces. To meet market demand, the government proposed in the 2022-23 budget and the Legislative Council has approved further injection of $1.5 billion to extend EHSS for four years to the 2027-28 financial year. With additional funding, it is anticipated that the EHSS will be able to support installation of EV charging and enabling infrastructure for some 140,000 parking spaces in around 700 car parks of existing private, residen private residential buildings, accounting for about half of the eligible parking spaces in Hong Kong. We are reviewing the experience gained in the initial stage of implementation of EHSS with a view to exploring further room for improvement to allow car parks in need of EV charging and private residential buildings to benefit. So my response to the question is as follows. Since the introduction of EHSS, we have approved 270 applications of which car parks of 35 estates or developments are with over 500 parking spaces. Successful applicants have started to employ consultants from last year, and since the first quarter of this year, they have started to employ contractors for installation works. As the EHSS subsidies are released according to actual costs incurred, the actual amount of subsidy receivable by each successful applicant and average amount of subsidy granted to each parking space will only be available when the installation works for the car parks are completed. Regarding the criteria adopted for vetting and approving EHSS applications, now before launching EHSS, we had solicited the views of stakeholders including property management, owners of corporations, owners, EV charging facilities, EV suppliers, the two power companies, etc. We've also consulted an interdepartmental working group and on 16th of December 2019, we submitted to the Electrical Panel on Environmental Affairs a paper for discussion on specific proposals for EHSS including the levels of subsidies, the criteria to be met by all target car parks. The proposals were supported by the panel. After consulting the working group, Department of Justice, ICAC, we formulated the implementation details and rules of EHSS and set them out in the EV charging at home subsidy scheme application notes. On 21st of October, 2020, the EHSS was open for application and details were uploaded to a dedicated website concurrently to provide guidance for, to those interested. Now, EHSS is funded by public resources. We've set a ceiling for the subsidy level. That is... That is... 30,000 per eligible parking space or 15 million in total for the entire development, whichever is lower. Now, to treat all applicant applications fairly, we make use of the promulgated implementation details and rules as mentioned above to determine the ceiling of subsidy and amount of subsidy receivable for each application. Car parks are considered being in the same development if they are ancillary to build buildings in the same development residential estates sharing a common estate name or buildings that are geographically adjacent to each other and with related building names are regarded as the same development. We've received applications from several large-scale residential estates and these are being vetted and processed accordingly. Mr. Gary Chang, now it's, it seems that the Secretary is uh, satisfied with the response, but we've heard that uh, at least 15,000 uh, car parks have uh, parking spaces have not received the full subsidy. Now, starting the scheme was suggested in 2018, and up till now, the public have the impression that the original intention was 30,000 for each car park, each parking space, and ultimately, 
it seems like we have more participants, but each car park, uh, the parking space subsidy is less than the uh, intended amount. So that led to a lot of arguments within building, uh, within corporate corporate owners corporations so in the latest round of subsidy will the government review the criteria so that more people can uh, enjoy the subsidy so we don't want large estates to have these arguments thank you mr gary chang for your uh concern and about the development now the original intention was uh, we have people uh, hong kong public living in high rises and each high rise will have many owners. So how can the different owners uh, be able to have access to EV charging? Now different estates can come to a consensus, that is they'll pay for it. And we have different estates uh, adopting this approach. Uh, sometimes the whole estate will undertake the works or individual owners will undertake the works. Well, some people, some people will say that the overall property management or owners corporation uh, can't reach a consensus. So the government came up with a subsidy scheme. The focus was that the government will subsidize to a certain extent so that they can reach a consensus. A lot of car owners, they should be relatively well off and they shouldn't... Uh, squabble over the uh, ultimate subsidy amount. So Mr. Chang, you'll understand there are economies of scale. When an estate uh, undertakes a large project, it will be cheaper than a smaller building. So at this point, we have a lot of large estates. They have more, they are a large scale and uh, they do not, receive the average uh, 30,000 subsidy, but they still reach a consensus and are willing to participate. So since that is our policy intention, then they should participate early because we want the public to understand that EVs will be the trend. So even without a sub government subsidy, they should uh, undertake this transition. Thank you, Chairman. The government wants to bring down carbon emissions and reach carbon neutral so an ev fleet will replace fossil fuel fleet so one requirement is that uh, eligibility uh, well, they have to be they have to have less than 60 percent open space car park but uh, a lot of uh, old building old estates have more than 60 percent open air car park how can these estates receive the subsidy chairman Thank you for providing this question. I'll put it this way. Our current policy, as you said, we, the our budget has allowed us more resources. So we still have some room after the queue. So we'll go back and discuss this with colleagues and see how we can promote the EV fleet and uh, outdoor spaces. Uh, if you want to install a charging infrastructure, there, the complexities will go up. Uh, there are uh, probably wiring issues, cabling issues, but we'll, we'll take into account your suggestion and with the aim of supporting the estates, if they can reach a consensus to uh, help uh, reduce pollution, reduce carbon emissions, and, uh, and so on. Mr. Yu Patlong. The EV charging subsidy team, we heard the number of applications. Uh, it indicates that uh, the public support it, car owners support it. So we're concerned about the progress of works from the application till installation, how long does it take? To, uh, does the government have any KPI? Now gas prices are at an all time high. We have more EVs in the market. 
So that can promote the use of EVs, and reduce carbon emissions. Well, the, the question is, how long do we have to wait for these facilities? So I hope uh, Secretary can address this issue of speed. Thank you for raising the question of accelerating the schedule. The public has a positive response. The, the, we had uh, more than double the number of expected applications. So the first group of applicants, you'll understand that uh, even the different owners, corporations, they work with property management companies, they have to reach a consensus and submit an application. So the first group of applicants that were approved, they are at the stage of awarding the contractors to commence work. So these works uh, take five to six months. So the first batch of completed works, uh, they should be able to complete it within this year. So we can see the first group of applicants uh, uh, and how long it takes uh, for them to receive or to uh, enjoy the facilities. Uh, oh, we now see that for every two new vehicles, one of them is an EV and uh, we are working with colleagues to see, to learn from our experience and speed up the process. So we already have accumulated some experience and the industry and government should be able to learn from that experience and speed up future applications. So by the end of this month, we'll have two online workshops. We'll get all the applicants, owners, corporations, property management companies. Uh, now we have to coordinate the efforts of property management companies and owners corporations and the government so i agree with what you said we already see a timetable uh, can we compress it even further so we'll have to rely on the upcoming work online workshop and put our heads together and uh, see if we can speed up the schedule Uh, Miss Wendy Hong. We want the the policy was to encourage the use of the EV fleet, but Hong Kong has a a lot of estates receiving the subsidies, but the usage is very low. Uh, sometimes they have a charging station, but it's uh, not in use. So. Can we uh, monitor these uh, uh, installations and prevent uh, the abuse of uh, these uh, schemes? Now, uh, my understanding is that the government encourages buildings to provide uh, charging facilities. There are two parts to this. I, for new buildings, through the Development Bureau and so on, some buildings are receive an exemption to provide the charging infrastructure. Now on this occasion we are referring to subsidizing old buildings before that scheme we talked about. So there are two policies. So we Hong Kong has two a two pronged approach for old and new buildings to install charging infrastructure, so people can charge from the homes. So coming back to the EHSS, this is, these are for estates, housing estates, those car owners, oh, they have an incentive to purchase an EV for, for, or if they have a parking space, they can install the infrastructure. 
we can lay out the wiring and individual car owners when they purchase an EV they can install a charger for their specific EV model and they apply for a meter and uh, they can start charging so you the concern regarding new buildings is that uh, uh, the EVs were not as popular as it is now so but for new residential buildings who have received this incentive the estate parking space if they rent those parking space even if they don't have the charging facility as long as they own the parking space they can apply to the utility company and they can start charging in a few days but your our, your question was regarding commercial buildings the parking space is owned by the uh, building owner how much do they charge uh, do, when they have the infrastructure when they have a charger in the past this was a commercial behavior and we the, the business sector has spotted the business opportunity and will provide charging services and they uh, will levy a fee for that service so they will install these facilities to meet demand because this is a trend so we encourage the different real estate developers to uh, participate in this transition. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Doreen Kong, I'd like to ask, why do you have only two online workshops? A lot of buildings, they have applied for the subsidy. Could you Conduct a few more rounds of these online workshops. Miss Doreen Kong, you can only ask one question. Thank you for your concern about the online workshop. Now, it's an online arrangement. A lot of people can participate. Uh, during COVID, we want to meet the largest number of buildings uh, as possible well i can also instruct my colleagues if need if necessary we can add an extra round of these online workshops well we want the public to understand the ev home subsidy scheme and we would like more owners to understand this development we have earmarked uh, hundreds of spaces and we do expect uh, uh, capacity for more applications so I want to tell the public that they should join as soon as possible we want different owners uh, even though the ownership is divided that they should reach a consensus so the government has taken one step and encourage them uh, to participate. The government might not have a second round of subsidy. Uh, it will be the owner's responsibility to reach a consensus. Um, so the government blueprint has stated that uh, by 2035 or earlier, we will legislate, we will amend the law and require that private vehicles be EVs or have zero emissions. So you'll have to understand that this is the trend and you'll need to uh, be able to meet this new development question three honorable jimmy mm, thank you president there are views that postage stamps are the name cards of a country or region 
as demonstrated in the Ukrainian authorities' recent issue of a set of military-themed postage stamps, of which more than 5 million sets have been hotly sold worldwide. In view of this, Hong Kong Post should take on a new mission for the new era and present a good narrative about Hong Kong through the stamps it issues, thereby enhancing Hong Kong's international image. In this connection, will the government inform this council one of the stamps issued by Hong Kong in the past five years set up by the themes of such stamps and an illustration of the popularity of such stamps by their sales volume as an indicator. D, whether Hong Kong Post will, in view of the changes of time, step up its public engagement efforts in respect of the theme selection and design of stamps. And three, whether Hong Kong P will, by making reference to the relevant advanced experience of the motherland and other countries, make bolder and more beneficial new attempts in respect of the theme selection and design of stamps to publicize through the stamps, Hong Kong's economic achievements and development opportunities, enhancing Hong Kong's international image as a result, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Home Affairs. President, storms with a long history of development generally reflect the many facets of the places of issue in terms of their history, culture, and society, despite the limits of their size. Since the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Hong Kong P Post, Hong Kong P has continuously released relevant stamp series to proactively promote the successful implementation of one country, two systems, and publicize Hong Kong's integration into the overall development of the country, which brings about new opportunities. My reply regarding the three sub questions raised by honorary Though mm, having consulted the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau and the HKP is as follows. The special administrative special commemorative stamps issued by Hong Kong P in the recent five years, i.e. from 2018 to 2022, can be grouped under eight categories according to their themes, namely one, Lunar New Year special stamps, two, major events of the year, three, series related to the country, four, joint issue with China Post and Mark Macau Post and Telecommunications Bureau, five, government services of the Hong Kong SRG, four, six, children's stamps, six, other themes, and eight, harm heartwarming stamps. As regards the above categories, HKP has issued 67 sets of stamps in the recent five years in total, including five sets of stamps under Lunar New Year, 13 sets of stamps under major years of the major events of the year, including the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR and the 25th anniversary of the station of the Chinese People's Liberation Army in Hong Kong. Ten sets of stamps uh, related to the Sikh country, including our motherland's history of development, world heritage in China series, etc. One set of stamps on Hong Kong Zhuhai Magao Bridge under category four issued jointly with the Hong China Post and Macau Post and Telecommunications Bureau. Five sets of stamps related to government services, including our police force. Two sets of stamps on children's stamp, uh, under children's stamps, 30 sets of stamps under other topics covering culture, arts and traditions, and one set of heartwarming stamps. The sales of individual sets of stamps are affected by different factors, such as the themes, the types of stamp products issued, and the face values. Among the more popular stamp categories, the sales volume of Lunar New Year stamps i.e. Category 1, generally amounts to 20 to $30 million. The sales volume of the series related to the country, i.e. Category 3, generally amounts to $6 million. As regards individual popular themes, the sales volume of, say, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China reached $12 million. The sales volume of other themes, i.e. Category 7, generally amounts to $6 million, where individual popular stamp themes related to classic characters or novels such as Bruce Lee's legacy in the world of martial arts and characters in Jin Yong's novels reached $25 million and $41 million, respectively. 
In terms of the STEM themes and designs, Hong HKP has been encouraging different public sectors and public to participate. They are welcome to submit proposals on STEM themes. Besides, HKP also seeks ideas and supportives on STEM themes from government bureaus, departments, statutory bodies and institutions, district councils, universities and schools, etc. In the recent five years, Hong Kong Post received about 60 to 70 suggestions on stamp themes on average per year, of which around 20 suggestions were submitted by members of the public. The Stamp Advisory Committee adopted a number of stamp themes suggested by members of the public. For example, the Chess Games Delight under Category 6 children's stamps and characters in Jean Jung's novels and Old Master O under Category 7 other themes. To step up public participation in STEM designs, Hong Kong Post organized STEM design competitions. In addition, since 2000 and just before the outbreak of the epidemic in 2019, Hong Kong Post have been organizing with the Education Bureau as the co-organizer annually the inter-school STEM exhibits competitions and workshops on making STEM exhibitions with various local philatelic societies to foster interest for the public on philately. In recent years, Hong Kong Post has issued stamps under a wide variety of themes to showcase the various characteristics and development of Hong Kong, which include, one, since the return of Hong Kong to our motherland, Hong Kong Post has issued a set of stamps on the series every five years to showcase the diversified development of Hong Kong. For example, the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong SARO commemorative stamps to be issued on July 1st this year. Two, to publicize the commissioning of large-scale infrastructure projects, Hong Kong Post issued Hong Kong Zhuhaima Galbridge stamps to commemorate its commissioning. Three, to showcase the advantages for the development of Hong Kong under the one country, two systems, and our motherland's support, Hong Kong has Post has released a special stamp issue depicting Hong Kong International Legal Hub to signify the establishment of the legal hub. On the 30th of June this year, the special stamps under the theme of Hong Kong Palace Museum will be issued to showcase the precious collections from the Palace Museum and promote the study and appreciation of the country's arts and culture by members of the public. And four, to promote the new development opportunities brought by Hong Kong's proactive integration into the overall national development, Hong Kong Post has issued Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area Special Stamps and Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area Development Special Stamps, featuring the strategic functions of Hong Kong on taking forward the development of the GBA and the third anniversary of the publication of the Outline Development Plan of GBA. Looking forward, Hong Kong Post will, through the release of stamps on various themes, continue to make proactive efforts to promote Hong Kong's integration into the country's development and demonstrate the great advantages it has in leveraging the support of the country while engaging the world at large. Thank you. Mr. Jimmy Ng. Thank you, President. I understand that on in January every year, members of the public will be invited to submit themes for the stamps which will be issued in the following two years. And it takes around 18 months to uh, print the stamps. Say for ad hoc themes, is there a mechanism for the ad hoc themes to be incorporated in your stamp issue program? Thank you, President. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ng, for your follow-up question. We do have the mechanism. Generally, it takes time for us to design stamps. There is a process to go through. There are different avenues, as stated in my reply, for collecting um, themes from the members of the public and also from various policy bureaus and departments and other organizations. And uh, we will look at these suggestions and consider them. 
and then we will forward them to the Stamp Advisory Committee to do a preliminary assessment. If the themes are considered uh, suitable, then we will engage um, the our uh, professional designers. We do have a team to come up with an initial design, and then that will be taken back to the assessment committee to decide on the most appropriate design. And after that is done, the stamp will be printed and produced. Every five years, we have we are showcasing a series uh, marking the return of Hong Kong to our motherland that is uh, prepared well in advance, so the uh, series can be produced in time every year. And um, Mr. Ng referred to ad hoc themes. Well, we can do that. Say, for example, the Winter Olympics, our country's team has performed well, and in the Tokyo Olympics, we have performed uh, excellently. So we have come up with um, um, stamps uh, to commemorate the excellent performance of our of our motherland's team. Um, so that can be done urgently. Dr. Johnny Ng, well, uh, we people do collect stamps, and I uh, agree with Mr. Ng that uh, the Hong Kong Post has 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 advanced through the times in the in the U.S. Australia. There are encrypted and virtual stamps being issued. Will the government consider uh, issuing virtual or digital stamps, which have a value to be stored and collected? so that we can promote the development of the digital economy in Hong Kong. President, uh, we basically issue physical stamps. When we talk about digital stamps, it has to do with the overall stamp policy. Can I defer to the C Secretary for CED to supplement? Thank you, Mr. Dr. Ng, for your question. If we are talking about uh, new channels, well, in the budget, the FS said that uh, we will be forming a committee for promoting digital economy. So a lot of uh, uh, policies in that direction will be deliberated by the committee. NFT, as referred to by Dr. John Ng, um, well, certain groups, certain con content, and certain infrastructure and certain regulatory issues are involved. So uh, various policy bureaus are undertaking the work right now. So we will report to members in an appropriate time. Ms. Eunice Young. Now, um, a stamp uh, carries uh, the Hong Kong story, and it can promote Hong Kong. And while well, it, um, it can be appreciated and has a value for uh, people's, uh, people collecting and storing it. Now, we do have, say, uh, in, uh, a stamp series on insects, and it, is, it was produced by a special technique, and it was uh, very vivid, and it had a it uh, carried good value for appreciation. And we also designed the 22K gold um, stamps. And the uh, Stamp Advisory Committee comprises members from different professions, including gra um, graphic designers. Will the government drop indicators um, requiring our designs to use new aesthetic um, techniques to um, design the stamps? Thank you, uh, Ms. Young. I mean, thank you, President. This is a very good suggestion. In the past few years, we've been proactively um, suggested, suggesting to the uh, STEM Advisory Committee to come up with an innovative designs to meet with um, the public's expectations. In terms of the themes, we try to broaden um, the the topics covered in our horizon. In my re main reply, I said that we have the Old Master O series because this is a very good sort of collective memory for uh, Hong Kong people. We do have that kind of series. Uh, for children's uh, stamps, while well, toys favored, games favored by uh, children are also favored. Uh, we also have a series on the local snacks, sesame rolls, etc. We do have those. And we try to come up with innovative designs. Well, for old stamps, maybe we just used um, pictures and photos, but we have already adopted novel designs. We have also come up with three-dimensional designs as well. Mr. Tan Fei. Thank you, President. 
Mr. Jimmy Ng's uh, question focuses on promoting Hong Kong or enhancing Hong Kong's international image through the issuing of stamps. And then the secretary said that um, stamps uh, come in Hong Kong come with different designs, cover different themes, covering the achievements of the motherland, and that is good. But then for um, Hong Kong Post and other government departments, how do you promote uh, such beautiful steps uh, to um, among the international community? Uh, would you be um, promoting the stamps through the internet, through organizing uh, special events, and so on? So, uh, how do you promote uh, Hong Kong through stamps overseas? Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Tang, for your question. Uh, in terms of publicity, we would um, adopt online and offline avenues. Like what Mr. Tang said, we would be promoting uh, the stamps uh, through Hong Kong Post. As for online uh, promotion, um, our stamp uh, development committee has um, also adopted, say, Facebook, Instagram um, in promoting our stamps. And on a dedicated uh, special themes who will produce APIs, like what the secretary said uh, for themes covering um, cartoon, comic uh, characters, and so on, and also um, feel 100% and so on. We would be producing APIs on those and then promote them through online platforms. And also we organize uh, different activities. We go to different schools and organizations to promote the stamps. We also participate in stamp exhibitions locally and overseas. So these are our promotion platforms. Mr. Perry Yu, I support what uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jimmy Ng suggested that we should enhance Hong Kong's international image through issuance of stamps. While well, being a part of the tourism trade, it's important that we enhance Hong Kong's international image. Now, the Hong Kong Post has uh, uh, been working hard on issuing stamps uh, covering themes like the Geo Park and, um, and uh, declared monuments and other cultural facilities and so on. And that can help in promoting Hong Kong's overall image. But my question is, on the choice of uh, themes for stamps, um, you do have a consultation process. And are you consulting the specific sectors like the tourism sector? Can we participate in any way? Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yu, for your uh, question. We do have such channels. Uh, we have set up the STEM Advisory Committee. And in my main reply, I also said that we will go to um, the district bodies, universities, uh, statutory bodies to seek their suggestions. On uh, special themes, we would also consult the relevant sectors, for example, for the heritage trails in Hong Kong, Hong Kong's um, geo park, and so on. We also consulted the relevant sectors um, and sought their views. We would like to um, consult as many as possible so that uh, the stamps, uh, the good stamps can be issued. Question number four, Mr. Chen Pui Lung. There are views that although the coronavirus disease 2019 epidemic has now subsided, there is still a risk of an outbreak of an epidemic in the wake of the relaxation of social distancing measures and entry restrictions, coupled with the emergence of mutant strains. Regarding the preparatory work for coping with an outbreak, Will the government inform this council, one, given that there are still imported cases from time to time currently, whether the government has reviewed the effectiveness of the measures to guard against the importation of cases, if so, or the details, if not the reasons for that, two, 
given that volunteers from a number of district organizations and community groups took the initiative to assist the government in distributing supplies when the fifth wave of the epidemic was severe, whether the government will, in mobilizing social forces to fight the epidemic in the future, devolve some of the decision-making powers to district units which are smaller in size and have greater flexibility so that anti-epidemic work can be carried out in a down-to-earth manner if some of the details, if not the reasons for that, and three, Given that the, appoint, uh, the government appointed an expert committee in 2003 to conduct a review on the government's work in handling and controlling the severe acute respiratory syndrome, commonly known as SARS, but some of the recommendations put forward by the expert committee have not yet been implemented, whether the government will review afresh the recommendations of the expert committee, prepare a review report on the government's current epidemic prevention work, and formulate the contingency plan for epidemic prevention. If so, of the details and timetable, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. Mr. President, adhering to the pursuit of dynamic zero infection, the government continues to implement the anti-epidemic strategy of preventing the importation of cases and the resurgence of domestic infections and focuses on three reductions, three focuses and one priority, which means focusing on reducing deaths, severe cases and infections, highlighting key groups of people, organizations and premises, and according priority to the elderly. We aim to build a stronger citywide protection barrier against the virus, thereby allowing our society to make steady strides along the path to normalcy. In consultation with the Home Affairs Bureau and the Hospital Authority, my reply to the various parts of the question raised by Mr. Chen Pui Long is as follows. One, as the global pandemic persists, and in view of the short incubation period of the Omicron variant, the detection of imported cases among inbound persons is unavoidable. The government continues to prevent the importation of cases under the policy direction of dynamic zero infection and maintains strident inbound prevention and control measures, which aim to, on the premise of the proper management of importation risks, allow Hong Kong to maintain contact with overseas places while rigorously guarding against imported cases from entering the local community. In order to be allowed to board for Hong Kong, generally persons coming to Hong Kong from overseas places must be fully vaccinated and hold a recognized vaccination record, hold a negative result proof of COVID-19 tests conducted within 48 hours before the scheduled time of departure, and hold a confirmation of room reservation as a suitable designated quarantine hotel or DQH. In addition to the boarding requirements above, all inbound persons are subject to test and hold at the airport upon arrival, followed by transfer to DQH in designated transport under closed loops management for compulsory quarantine of at least seven days with no option for home quarantine. Relevant inbound persons are also subject to multiple tests during the period. Any confirmed case detected during the test and hold or in DQX will be transferred to a community isolation facility hotel for isolation or sent to a public hospital facility for treatment and monitoring. For inbound persons eligible for early discharge from quarantine after completion of seven days of compulsory quarantine, they would have been tested negative for 10 consecutive times, including the pre-departure test. Even so, they are still subject to self-monitoring for seven days and compulsory nucleic acid tests on the ninth and twelfth days of arrival at Hong Kong. Since April, the vast majority of imported cases have been detected during test and hold or compulsory quarantine in DQH. This shows that on the premise of proper management of importation risks, the relevant inbound prevention and control measures are effective in preventing imported cases from entering the community. The government will continue to closely monitor the epidemic situation of different places and will consider under the risk-based principal factors, such as the epidemic situation in particular places, testing rate, vaccination rate, volume of arrivals and actual imported cases, as well as taking into account the developments of the local epidemic situation 
and the relevant socioeconomic factors to adjust the boarding quarantine and testing requirements for arrivals from places as the situation warrants. In the face of the raging epidemic, the community is united to fight the virus. Among the many sectors of our society, including local, local organizations, NGOs, clansmen organizations, charity groups, volunteers, uniform groups, youth organizations, religious groups, and ethnic minorities, service organizations, etc., have been actively responding to the government's call to participate in the packaging and distribution of anti-epidemic service bags. The Home Affairs Bureau and the Home Affairs Department are now stock taking the experience gained during the relevant operation for providing reference to the government in planning similar activities in the future. Three, after the SARS outbreak in 2003, the government established the Expert Committee to conduct a review on the management and control of the ed epidemic, as well as identify lessons to be learned to better prepare Hong Kong for any future outbreaks. Over the years, the government and the hospital authority have made efforts to optimize the healthcare system in Hong Kong with reference to the recommendations of the expert committee. Apart from setting up the Infectious Disease Center at Princess Margaret Hospital, infectious disease facilities in nine major acute hospitals have also been strengthened. In response to the COVID-19 epidemic, the hospital authority also converted some general wards into temporary isolation wards and established a number of designated hospitals during the fifth wave. Together with the original isolation beds, a total of about 11,500 beds could be provided for receiving COVID-19 patients. In addition, having experienced a SARS epidemic, the hospital authority has already formulated response plans for communicable diseases with public health significance and established a rigorous monitoring mechanism to identify and arrange suspected infected patients to receive isolation treatment in hospitals as soon as possible so as to prevent community transmission. At the same time, a series of measures on infection control guidelines and training information dissemination as well as occupational safety and health have also been implemented. The hospital authority will review anti-epidemic measures, adjust response plans and conduct drills with relevant departments with reference to the latest international recommendations recommendations and expert opinions in order to be prepared. Over the past two years, we have been conducting periodic reviews of our experience in combating the epidemic, listening to the views of experts and different sectors of society, and continuously optimizing our anti-epidemic measures, manpower and capabilities. At the same time, we closely monitor the epidemic situation and formulate policies as well as preparedness plans in order to prepare for an outbreak or arrival of the next wave. The government is open to conducting a timely review and formulating future anti-epidemic contingency plans after the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chen Poulang, well, recently there's been a resurgence of confirmed cases, and the chief executive agreed yesterday that according to various parameters, we seem to have a rising trend. It is expected that in the coming days, there may be 1,000 confirmed cases a day. So on this point, I'd like to ask the government for its assessment of the epidemic situation. Is it the sixth wave now? And when are we going to designate uh, hotels and clinics to prepare for the uh, next wave of the epidemic. Secretary, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Long, for the questions. In fact, for a while in the community, according to various indicators, we have uh, identified a rising trend. We believe this to be a rebound of the fifth wave. Now, with the catering establishments and shelter premises reopening, and with increased economic activities in the community, we're having more. Uh, activities and exchanges uh, among people, and that rising trend is only to be expected. Of course, we continue to take a rigorous approach in handling the epidemic. On the one hand, we continue to monitor these parameters. On the other hand, we also have a number of indicators relating to hospitals, including the COVID-19 patients admission rate, uh, the number of severe cases and death cases, and also vaccination rate, which is also on the rise. We understand that uh, in the community, we have a certain level of protection. Now, we have some indicators remaining steady, and yet 
we also see an increase in the number of confirmed cases along with other indicators. And that is why we announced yesterday that the anti-epidemic measures now in place will be strengthened with precision, and meaning that for bars, clubs, nightclubs, as we see a number of outbreaks in these clusters, we do require in the coming 14 days, that is the next cycle, all patrons must produce a negative RAT result tested in the past 24 hours before entering these premises. So this is the one of the new measures we have. Now, Mr. Chen just now asked when we are going to um, commence the uh, community isolation facilities again. At the moment, the Penny's Bay communica uh, Community Isolation Facility is in operation. For confirmed cases, risk assessment will be conducted, and if need be, these confirmed cases will be sent to the facility for isolation. And yesterday, we also mentioned that um, we have a multi-tier, multi-triage uh, strategy for the fifth wave, and we'll continue to uphold rigorously the social distancing measures, including uh, sending confirmed cases to isolation facilities. For example, if there is a confirmed case sharing the same room or toilet with the other household members, the confirmed case should not be subject to home isolation. Instead, the case should be sent to our isolation facility. This is to safeguard the health of the general public as well as their family members. And this policy will be upheld stringently. As for contact tracing and uh, increasing the capacity for PCR tests, and testing for elderly, medication, etc. We'll continue to take forward these initiatives and we will meanwhile continue to keep in view the various indicators to try our best to control the epidemic. Mr. Kenneth Lau, Mr. Preston, you may recall that during the peak of the fifth wave, many social organizations have taken the initiative to gather resources and distribute them to the community, especially anti-epidemic service bags. Now, but some organizations might have constraints, and as a result, they might have distributed resources repeatedly, le uh, leaving some um, not being able to obtain any. However, according to the main reply from the administration, I don't see any explanation how the administration will step up cooperation with these organizations. Now, will the government consider playing a coordination role in the future so that resources collected in community can be redistributed more effectively? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Member, for the question. Indeed, in the fifth wave, because of the feature of the Omicron variant being highly transmissible. The number of confirmed cases in a day once reached 10,000. So within the government, we worked with different healthcare institutions and government departments to fight the epidemic together in terms of stepping up testing and distribution distribution of uh, anti-epidemic resources. We've done our level best, but we also note Mr. Uh, Chan's, uh, Mr. Lang's comment. Indeed, um, meanwhile, there have been a lot of community organizations and groups staying united to distribute resources to the community, and they would very much want to uh, lend a helping hand as well. I understand the Home Affairs Department and the Home Affairs Bureau are in charge of coordination in this regard, and they are conducting a review at the moment so as to stop take the experience in, say, distributing anti-epidemic service bags so as to provide reference to the government in planning similar uh, activities in the future in the event of similar incidents uh, arising 
uh, again uh, so that we can have better cooperation with community organizations so that we can all stay united in fighting the epidemic. Mr. Edward Lang, the six cabin hospitals and community facilities have been converted to a standby mode. Now, if the sixth wave hit us, hits us, uh, how soon can we raise our capacity? Because many colleagues have returned to their original positions, and we have several thousand, um, several thousand temporary jobs cut already, because we're concerned that uh, these facilities won't come on stream until very late, uh, just like what happened in the fifth wave. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Leung, for the question. As we mentioned earlier, we have different preparedness plans to cope with a future major outbreak or future wave as part of our anti-epidemic strategy. And like Mr. Leung said, we do have facilities in particular, community isolation facilities. And it's all about when we start the operation. Indeed, at the moment, they are on standby. And in order to commence operation, we need to take three steps. First, in terms of managing these facilities, and second, in terms of uh, healthcare staff for providing services in the facilities, and third, the security guards and uh, cleaners. I mentioned these three fronts, and we do have the relevant plans to kickstart operation in a short period of time. There may be different needs in these different areas. Now, for healthcare staff, according to the plan, um, the they can start the work in just 24 or 48 hours if necessary. Now, having drawn on the experience in the fifth wave, in terms of our preparedness for the next wave and the necessary manpower, we have um, preparedness plans. Mr. Martin Yao, Mr. President, the fifth wave has shown that the public health care resources in Hong Kong are in insufficient in coping with a major outbreak, in particular manpower. For frontline manpower, there is a severe shortage. In terms of epidemiological and communicable disease expertise, we do not have sufficient professionals. So. In terms of public health care, prevention of diseases and control of diseases, is there sufficient training? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Liao, for asking a very good question. In the past two and a half years, whilst fighting the epidemic and being very responsive to cope with the situation, we also need to plan for the future. Mr. Liao referred to training, especially training in response to major healthcare, public health incidents and communicable diseases in universities and in the medical colleges. So we do have dedicated training. In my recollection, in fact, after SARS, uh, training of this nature has been a step up su substantially. And I do agree that we should continue to step up training for our healthcare staff so that they can be equipped with the latest knowledge and uh, statistics. And also knowledge on implementing infectious control measures. So yes, we do need to step up training. Apart from healthcare professionals, we also need to educate the general public, and we also need a dedicated, you know, um, you know, training on special uh, knowledge, say on uh, gene sequencing and laboratory management. And we agree that we should strengthen training in these areas as well. Mr. Dennis Long. Well, just now, Mr. Edward Long asked about 
isolation facilities. And the sec secretary mentioned that the three reductions are three focuses and one priority strategy. And community facility could help prevent um, the virus from spreading in the community. The FTU has this experience. We found that in terms of employing security guards and cleaners, the situation leaves much more to be desired. Now, uh, sometimes they may be hired at uh, very good wages, and sometimes uh, they may all be sacked at, in one go. We put the question to the Department of Health to, uh, uh, to no avail, and I wonder if you would consider having auxiliary uh, teams, such as the auxiliary police or the auxiliary medical aid service, so that um, more people can be trained to become security guards or cleaners. If need be, we can have a we can have a reserve for the <coughs> needed manpower because. This at uh, the moment, the situation is not desirable. Secretary, can you explain this uh, aspect? Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Long, for the questions. Now, in join on the experience gained in this wave, apart from healthcare <coughs> staff, as mentioned by other members, there are also other personnel who have played a crucial role in our preparedness plan for cleaning staff and security guards working at community isolation facilities. This is something we need to uh, step up our efforts. And apart from healthcare staff, training should also be provided to security guards and cleaners, as suggested by members, will go back and give it a thought. But all in all, in terms of the overall manpower plan, we need to be prepared to cope with the rapidly raging next wave. Thank you, Thank you Chair, uh, President. There are views pointing out that the Cross Bay Link, Zhang Guanou, and the Zhang Guanou Lamtin Tunnel, which are under construction, are the transport lifeline of Zhengguanou in the future and can resolve the long-standing problem of serious traffic congestion. In this connection, will the government inform the Council whether the current works progress of the two projects meet the need meet with the expectations, including which work procedures have not yet been completed and when they are expected to be officially commissioned? And two, as the government indicated earlier, uh, in reply to my question raised in respect of estimate of expenditure 2022-2023 that if the toll waiver for TKOT was implemented before the commissioning of TKOLTT, it would induce additional traffic demand and result in heavier traffic flow for TKOT. What actual data or statistics the government has and whether it has examined the time spent by vehicles using TKOT due to their having to stop and pay the toll? And three, whether it has formulated plans to arrange upon the official commissioning of CBL, TKO, and TKO LTT to divert some of the public transport routes running through TKOT to these new facilities. If so, of the details, if not, whether it will immediately formulate the plans and submit them to the Council for consideration. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, President. In order to provide a more convenient road access between Zhengguanou and Guntong, the Eastern Harbor Crossing, as well as to facilitate smoother traffic in Zhengguanou District, the government is taking forward at full steam the construction of Zhengguanou Lam Tin Tunnel, Cross Bay Link Zhengguanou, which connects to the eastern end of Zhengguanou L TKO LTT. Upon commissioning, the journey time between Zhengguanou and Kowloon East will be reduced by about 20 minutes. On the other hand, as announced in the 2019 policy address, when traffic conditions permit, the government will seek to reduce the cost of using government to hold tunnels and control areas incurred by the public, <clears throat> public transport operators and the transport trades. Therefore, the government will waive the toll for Zhengguanou Tunnel upon the commissioning of the Zhengguanou LTT when the traffic to and from Zhengguanou can be diverted. 
After consultation with civil engineering and development department and transport department, my reply to various parts of the question raised by the Honorable Stanley Lee is as follows. At present, installation of all major structural components of CBL has been completed. For the TKO LTT, the structural works of administration building, the ventilation buildings, tunnels, and various viaducts have been substantially completed. The project team is pressing ahead with electrical and mechanical equipment, ventilation, fire services, connecting roads, noise barriers, traffic control, and surveillance, and utilities with a view to commissioning the two projects in tandem this year. The congestion of Zhengguan O Tunnel is due to traffic flow exceeding design capacity. According to traffic figures in 2021, during the morning and evening peak hours on weekdays, the number of vehicles using the tunnel exceeded design capacity by 40 to 50 percent. <clears throat> the pictures illustrating the congestion are at the annex, taking the weekday morning peak hour condition of Kowloon bound traffic of Zhongguan O Tunnel as an example. Traffic congestion is observed from time to time at the tunnel portal, even when there is no tolling facility. Uh, you can refer to Exhibit 1 of Annex. The traffic queue can extend to some 1.6 kilometers from the tunnel portal to Wanbo Road near, uh, Wanbo Road ne near the Hong Kong Velo Velodrome, affecting the traffic of the local roads. Nevertheless, the traffic between the tunnel portal and the toll plaza is relatively smooth. You can refer to Exhibit 2. For weekday evening peak hour condition of Zhongguan O bound traffic, there is traffic con congestion between the toll plaza and tunnel portal, and some of the traffic queues can tail back to beyond the tolling facility. You can refer to Exhibits 3 and 4. Now, some will argue that stopping to pay toll is a contributor to congestion, but according to my explanation and looking at the um, diagrams, we can understand that that is not the case. The congestion of Zhongguan O Tunnel stems from number of vehicles using the tunnel exceeding the capacity of the tunnel during peak hours. At present, if the queuing time is not accounted for, it takes a few seconds for a vehicle to make toll payment using cash or stop and go pay payment at Chiangguan uh, Tunnel. So stopping to pay toll is not the root cause of traffic congestion. If the toll of TKOT is waived ahead of commissioning of the TKO LTT, it will induce additional traffic demand, aggravating the current traffic situation. It's anticipated that the traffic queues will extend rather than be shortened, further affecting local roads. Therefore, from the management perspective, it's more prudent to waive the toll of TKOT upon commissioning of TKO LTT. To tie in with the upcoming commissioning of TKO LTT, the TD is exploring ways to enhance franchise bus service network and to provide public with more convenient and efficient options of public transport. For example, after consulting the district councils, TD will proceed to introduce a new bus route plying between Hong Sing Garden in Zhengguan O and Taipo Industrial Estate via the TKO LTT. The TD is also identifying more new bus routes via the TKO LTT and will consult the, the district councils before implementation. Now, after commissioning of TKO LTT, the Transport Department will explore the feasibility of diverting some of the existing bus routes to route through TKO LTT upon further review, reviewing of actual traffic conditions of Zhongguan O District and the two tunnels. The operation of relevant bus routes, the utilization of TKOT, bus, bus interchange, and other relevant factors. When, consu when considering suitable proposal, TD will examine individual bus routes and whether uh, travel time can be saved.
president or secretary, I think you're familiar with this picture. It's a traffic congestion picture. It's because of congestion we can take such a, uh, a photo. Now, when I was nominated for elections, I was uh, instructed to give specific suggestions rather than just criticisms. Now, in this question, I have also included my personal opinion, but the government, uh, unfortunately, uh, they have come up with a bunch of excuses. We asked whether we can have nine carriages and ten carriages. So, moving on to this question, now, by waiving the $3 tunnel toll, why can't it reduce congestion? The government answered that the traffic flow will increase. Well, when cars stop and pay, it will increase the, the delays. So the whole congestion arises from toll paying and congestion. Mr. Sandley, I want to ask, now since you've declined my proposal, have you consulted the, the 500,000 Jungwano population? Thank you, Mr. Lee, for your follow-up. Uh, the traffic management uh, tolls have never been a consideration. We have considered only traffic management, how we can shorten the travel time, how can we enhance the tra travel experience. Now, if you review to Moon Chalapgok when that tunnel was commissioned at the same time we waived the Qingma bridge toll. So all this indicates that in traffic management our principles and efficiency have to be considered. At the same time when traffic is moving smoothly we want to reduce the traffic or travel expense and we also need to um, uh, consider the interests of uh, transport operators. So please rest assured, the TKO tunnel toll, uh, the financial implications are not a concern. It's just a traffic management issue. Now during the process, we have previously made it clear that when TKO LTT is commissioned, when traffic conditions improve, we will waive a TKO toll. Now, I believe Mr. Lee uh, is aligned with us that uh, we are, are want to provide a safe and uh, convenient travel experience for commuters. Ms. Lam Soai, as a Chengkwan O resident and a district councillor, uh, I have I'm con uh, stuck in traffic with some 400,000 Chengkwan O residents in the morning and uh, at night after uh, returning home from work. So I've asked the Works Progress and Secretary, I would like you to pledge that when works cannot be completed this year, will you consider other facilities uh, being implemented in phases and uh, make compensation to our residents, but not uh, limited uh, to uh, uh, waiving the toll earlier. So when you waive the toll it doesn't increase traffic flow it makes the roads uh, smoother thank you president thank you president thank you miss lam uh, our engineering works uh, we've consulted cedd and relevant government departments we're confident that uh tko ltt and the uh, cbl can uh, be commissioned this year so the other arrangements, I hope uh, they won't be necessary. Now, during the process, I'd like you to understand that Hong Kong is very crowded. Now, even though the government builds roads, bridges, and train networks, but travel demand is still high. And uh, we encourage the public to use public transport currently public transport usage is 90% and we're leading in the world and uh, uh, the people who rely on private vehicles I hope uh, 
in the Zhengguan O district where there are 400,000 residents. We, we were very concerned. Otherwise, we wouldn't have TKO LTT. Uh, we wouldn't have CBL. We wouldn't uh, speed up uh, the infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Stanley Lee. Thank you, President. Uh, in light of the government's response, uh, he said that uh, the Qingma Bridge toll was waived, but uh, we're only talking about a three dollars a, a wave toll of uh, the TKO toll. Now, if that was fifty dollars or eighty dollars, and you reduce, if you waive that toll, you would attract uh, outside traffic. A TKO tunnel only charges three dollars. Now, if this were a deterrent, it would have done so long ago. If because if the Mr. Stanley Lee, please raise your question. This is not a debate. I'd like uh, to provide some background, and my question is the, the official understands the background. My question was Will you instruct your team to uh, scrap the toll? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I understand Mr. Lee raising this question. Uh, he wants uh, the toll to be waived as soon as possible. But as a as an official responsible for traffic management, we need to be responsible for the whole public. If we don't have scientific data analysis, if that indicates that there is no alternative route, and if we rave the toll, and if that leads to traffic congestion, we feel it's not suitable to waive the TKO tunnel toll. But as we said earlier, TKO LTT uh, and CBL, when it's commissioned this year, we will uh, waive the toll. Thank you, Mr. President. Last question. Last question, seeking an oral reply. Mr. Kenneth Lau has informed me in advance that his question will be asked by uh, Dr. Lo Wai Kwok on his behalf. Dr. Lo Wai Kwok. President, to promote the development of renewable energy, argued the government introduced in 2018 the feed in tariff FIT scheme in collaboration with the two power companies for the private sector to sell the RE and Energy generated to the two power companies at a rate higher than the normal electricity tariff rate. However, the government lowered the FIT rates in April this year. Many, many members of the public who intend to apply for joining the scheme have relayed that owing to the high costs involved in the installation of solar power devices, the government's lowering of the FIT rates without consultation has caused them great budgeting problems and worry that they may not be able to recover the costs before the scheme expires at the end of 2033. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it knows the respective total numbers of applications from owners of village houses and from owners of industrial and commercial buildings which were received, approved and rejected by the two companies in each year since the implementation of this scheme and the reasons for the rejected applications among them, the number of those which were required to lower the proposed generating capacity as they would exceed the low capacity of the power grids and the measures put in place by the two power companies to improve situation. Two, as it is learned that the reason for the government's decision to lower the FIT rates is that the cost for the installation of solar power devices have decreased in recent years, resulting in a shortened payback period for investment. Of the relevant data and the method for calculating the payback period, as well as the mechanism and criteria for adjusting the FIT rates. And three, whether it would consider extending the time period of the scheme to continue encouraging public participation in the development of RE, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for the Environment. Present, to promote renewable energy, we together with the power companies have launched the fit in tariff FIT scheme since end of 2018 to shorten the payback period for private RE systems to about 10 years. The government has also implemented a series of support measures, such as suitably relaxing the requirements on the installation of solar energy generation systems on the rooftop of new territories, village houses, and facilitating the private sector installing solar energy generation systems at open car parks. 
In comparison with only some 200 private RE systems that were connected to the power grid in Hong Kong in the decade prior to the introduction of this scheme, the two power companies received a total of over 20,000 applications from end 2018 to the first of, uh, quarter of 2022 following the introduction of the scheme, of which over 18,000 applications have been approved. Upon completion of installation of the systems approved, it is estimated that about 300 million kilowatts of electricity can be generated each year, which is sufficient to meet the electricity demand of about 90,000 houses, roughly equivalent to all houses in the central and western district. My reply to the question raised by Mr. Lau is as follows. One, applications under the FIT scheme mainly involve the installation of RE systems in village houses or detached houses with over 15,000 15, such applications in total, amounting to over 70% of the total number, of which more than 14,000 have been approved. There are over 1,000 FIT applications involving the installation of RE systems in commercial and industrial premises, accounting for about 5% of the total number, of which over 900 applications have been approved. No application under the FIT scheme has been rejected by the power company so far. By implementing the FIT scheme, the power companies have to ensure the safe and reliable power supply. Therefore, if the generating, generating capacity of an individual RE system applied for under the FIT scheme exceeds the capacity of the power grid concerned, the power companies will liaise with the applicant on adjusting the general capa generating capacity so as to ensure that the electricity system remains safe and reliable when the RE system is connected to the grid. Since the introduction of the FIT scheme, the CLP Power Company has adjusted the generating capacity of about 1,300 applications, about 6% of the total number. These applications are mainly related to the installation of systems with a generation capacity of 10 kilowatts or less in Yunlong, Taipo, and North District. As for the Hong Kong Electric Company, Limited has not adjusted the generating capacity of any application so far. To further support the development of RE, CLP has been assigning dedicated customer service managers to follow up on each application and suggest different technical solutions to resolve the matter and consider whether and if so, how to lay or reinforce the power grid. If the solution requires laying or reinforcing the power grid, apart from considerations on cost effectiveness and impact on tariff, the works and applications applications involved will be complicated and time-consuming. FIT applicants may choose to accept immediately a generating capacity at a layer, lower level lower than they, that they have applied for, or wait until the completion of the reinforcement works, which will allow connection of their RE systems to the CLP power grid at the capacity level they have applied for. The two power companies will continue to explore different ways to flexibly increase the capacity of the power grid, enabling more systems to get connected to the grid so that the FIT scheme can be fully leveraged to facilitate the private sector in developing distributed RE. Two, to encourage early participation of those who are interested in installing RE systems, FIT schemes worldwide are all designed to offer better FIT rates to those who join the schemes in an early stage. Our country has also adopted a similar direction for RE development and has from 2021 onwards cancelled central financial subsidies for various newly constructed RE projects and implemented REIT parity, whereby the FIT rates are determined according to the prices of local fired electricity generation or through participation in market-based transactions. The government and the two power companies have completed the annual review of FIT rates recently, during which changes in the cost of installing and maintain, maintaining RE systems were considered. The FIT rates were adjusted downward from 3 to $5 per unit to 2.5 to $4 per unit to provide sufficient financial incentives while balancing the tariff impact of FIT. In view of the significant reduction in the cost of distributed RE system in recent years, uh, by about 30 to 40 percent as compared to that before the I FIT scheme was launched, and that there is only a downward adjustment of about 15 to 20 percent in the new FIT raise, we believe that the FIT participants will still be able to enjoy a payback period of about 10 years 
where the new FIT rates as the scheme was designed. The new FIT rates will also continue to be among the highest offered by similar schemes worldwide. The new FIT rates can get can continue to provide sufficient and appropriate financial incentives, incentives continuously encouraging various sectors to develop distributed RE systems. The FIT scheme is implemented under the scheme of control agreements signed between the two power companies and the government. As the SEAs run till 31st December 2033, FIT is offered throughout the project life of the RE systems that have joined the FIT scheme until the day when the term of the SCAs expires. As mentioned above, uh, subsidies for RE have been gradually reduced internationally. From 2021 onwards, our country has cancelled the central financial subsidies for various newly constructed RE projects and implemented REIT parity. Under this general direction, we believe that the chance of the FIT scheme being extended beyond the expiry of the SEAs in 2033 is slim. Yet the electricity produced by the relevant RE systems will belong to the owners of the relevant systems and can thus ease off the owner's expenditure on electricity charges. The government will review and adjust the measures on promoting RE from time to time, having regard to the actual circumstances to meet our target of increasing the share of RE in the fuel mix for electricity generation to 7.5 to 10% by 2035 and to 15% gradually thereafter with a view to attaining the long-term goal of net zero electricity generation and carbon neutrality before 2050. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Le Kwok, President, on behalf of Mr. Kenneth Lau and family, I would like to declare that they have participated in the FIT scheme. The intent of the FIT was to provide economic incentives to the public to take part in RE development. Before adjusting downwards, the FIT rates of response was very enthusiastic and achieved good results. Without consultation, the FIT rates were lowered and dampening people's intensive of installing uh, RE uh, devices. The, the government's measure make it difficult for us to achieve the target set out in Climate Action Plan 2050 and slow down the progress of achieving carbon neutrality. Has the government assessed the impact brought by the lower the lowering of the FIT rates? If the number of participants uh, reduces, would you consider adjusting the FIT rates again, um, adjusting it upwards? Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for uh, Mr. Lau for following up on the relevant issues. Let me make two points. First, what, why? Uh, different countries and places, including our uh, our motherland, have implemented FIT. We adopt a similar approach. It will not be because of the latest measure um, that we are actually. Um, cutting down our efforts on cutting down on carbon emission. And we would like to promote the development of um, the uh, industry on installing or producing solar panels. Compared to several years ago, well, th there were 200 uh, such projects. Now it has increased by 10 times to 20. Uh, thousand. So it, uh, we would like to sustain, um, ensure the sustainable development and competitive pricing of the relevant products. And even after adjusting the FIT rates, we are confident that uh, the development will be healthy. And among different countries in the world, our FIT rates are still the highest. So it will not um, dampen our efforts in decarbonization. We try to balance um, ensuring that there is a stable tariff and also the development of the FIT system. In in the past month, compared to the days before the adjustment, actually the number of applications has not decreased but rather risen. When we launched the policy at the outset, we also said that we would be adjusting the FIT race gradually, and we will try to uh, ensure that the payback period is around 10 years. Now, the products have uh, got cheaper, so it's the right time for us to adjust the FIT race. 
and we, would, we will be able to achieve our goal of cutting down on carbon emission. Chen, Ms. Chen Yutming, thank you. FIT is a very good measure. It can promote environmental protection. So the government hopes that um, it would be better if more village houses can install uh, the RU systems. The higher the FIT rates, the better for us, of course, but a lot of uh, village house owners cannot apply for the scheme because if we, they want to do so, they have to spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars to enhance the electricity installations. And also the electricity uh, systems in the remote villages are rather backward, and the power companies have told us that there is a limitation to the number of RE systems that can be connected or else um, the capacity, the low capacity will be uh, exceeded. If the government would like to promote um, solar power development in village uh, houses, will you talk to the power companies to improve the situation so that more village house owners can install solar panel? in village houses. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Ms. Chen is, of course, very familiar with the uh, setting in the uh, rural areas and how they can develop RE systems to help decarbonization in Hong Kong. Like what Ms. Chen said, in some villages, uh, the power grids may be relatively weaker and if a lot of villages would like to install um, solar power uh, devices, the stability of power supply may be adversely affected. It is exactly because of this that in the main reply, we said that we would uh, uh, um, ask the two power companies to work um, together with the village houses. There are two aspects for existing villages. We would like to help um, village houses to install solar panels. So uh, at the same time, we are asking the two power companies to reinforce the power grid in various villages so that these power grids can support the uh, solar panels in village houses. So we see eye to eye with the legislator on that. We would ask the power companies to strengthen their work in this area because but then um, the power grids in villages differ so they have to take a detailed look at the situation of each it each individual village they will have to be looking at the power grid that some of the power grid may go through private landlords so if they are have to reinforce power grid uh, that may take time so i hope that you can appreciate this difficulty and support our two pronged approach if the power grids allow and the villages uh, have con consent then we can work on them first and then at the same time we will work together with the power companies to reinforce the power grid and strengthen the relevant infrastructure network Dr. Junius Ho, I'm happy that the FIT scheme was launched in 2018. I think I can claim credit for it because at the um, Environmental Affairs Panel, we have uh, passed a non-binding motion to urge the government to remove barriers to allow village houses to install RU systems. So today, the secretary said that around 15,000 villages uh, have, um, I mean, village houses have uh, made the applications amounting to 70 percent, and 18,000 uh, projects are producing 300 million kilowatts. If you talk about four dollars per unit, then it uh, amounts to 1.2 billion dollars. Each year, this is a good measure, and we should uh, continue with it. You said um, that you're talking to the two power companies about the expiry in 2033. I think the government, even without their help, uh, should um, promote the scheme at full speed. So what is your projection? Well, the uh, number double from 20,000 now. Do you have any indicator or target? Thank you, Dr. Ho, for your support. Like what uh, Dr. Ho said, when we um, 
drew up the policy. Unlike overseas countries, uh, we are not just offering uh, TIF rates several times more than the normal tariff. We are were mindful that uh, space was limited in Hong Kong, and you have urged us to uh, talk to the development bureau to remove the barriers, and then they can uh, the village houses can uh, erect stru structure up to say uh, erect a, a device up to two meters high, so on. So three out of four applications come from, say, village houses or detached houses. So uh, we appreciate your support. Looking forward, what, what will be our projection? Uh, there are challenges. Well, let's take a look uh, back at what happened. The program has been in place for three years or so. We see well, that the growth um, has been linear to a certain extent, so to speak. So that's our experience in the past three years. Uh, we would be able to achieve a payback period of 10 years, despite um, the downward adjustment of the um, FIT rates, because, uh, well, the products have got cheaper. So uh, we are optimistic about our future prospects. We can maintain uh, our growth rate. But then, of course, there are variables, and we look forward to your support of the initiative. Let me say this. FIT for FIT. Well, the earlier you participate, the better. So, Dr. Ho and other members. So, if you um, have an, an appropriate um, project, um, please take part as early as possible. So that will that means you will enjoy the FIT rates for a longer period. Now, we have gained a lot of experience in the three past three years, and I hope. Uh, that you can continue to support our scheme. We also encourage innovation. So for this year, when we adjust the FIT rates, we talked to the Development Bureau on how the um, multiple uses can be uh, put to a single place and that we can put in more solar panels. And we have, um, in relation with, together with the Development Bureau and Building Department to encourage uh, solar panels to be installed in public or open car park parking spaces, which can also serve as a sh uh, shelter. Now, um, we have uh, received uh, several dozen uh, requests about this uh, new measure for individual open car parks. I, we hope that um, we can receive an um, enthusiastic response. Mr. Stephen Hall, thank you, President. Members of the public think that this is FIT scheme is a very good one. When we launched the scheme, um, it seems uh, that uh, the message was quite simple, and we would be receiving 3 to $5 in the TI, um, TIF rates. Uh, per unit. So there are different packages, and so um, their view is that it's, it's going to be a simple arrangement. So they have not considered the um, sort of dialogue and discussions uh, between you and the two power companies on the changes in the tariff. So the government should do more explanation. So as what Mr. Sa Wong said, the earlier you participate, the better. So can you tell us whether um, the $2.5 will be further lowered, or is there any room for increasing the rate? Thank you, Mr. Ho. The intent of the policy is that without the subsidy, the payback period can be, say, several dozen years. And the lifespan of such solar panels is just uh, some 20 years. And in the past, why was that so little investment into such projects? Because the payback period is too long. So the overall policy aims to uh, keep the payback period, say, at 10 years. So if you look at other places, the uh, TIF is getting lower because the relevant products are also uh, getting cheaper and cheaper. 
So uh, going forward, the FIT rates are bound to be lowered. Well, 10 years ago, the country launched the scheme. And now, well, the FIT are rates are lower than the normal tariff rates. So they are, um, well, offering a price which is similar to those of local um, coal-fired electricity generation. So the, l the earlier the, uh, you participate, um, the more benefits you can get. So let's work together to uh, decarbonize. Government bill, first reading, Inland Revenue Amendment Tax.